Well, today's lecture, we're looking at we're looking at creating custom geometry. So maybe this has come up in your own project so far that you know, you're designing this, this building and you're looking at some of the components that are available within the Reddit library, and you realize that you know it's maybe a little bit boring in terms of some of the geometry. Everything is at right angles. There's no sort of um, really sort of unique uh, you need components in there, and maybe you, you feel a little bit constrained by, by what's available to you. Well, today we're looking at, at things that you can do, tools that you can use to create 3D geometries that might give you a little bit sort of looser way of expressing some of the ideas or some of the aesthetics that you're trying to go for with your design. So, we're going to look at, today we're going to look at modeling in place. Uh, and Further on down the road, we're going to look at, uh, at strategies that, that you might use if you're going to create a component that you're going to use in a lot of other projects, something that you want to replicate in other projects. But today we're really talking about things that are specific to a project or a component. If we if you create geometries using the methods that we're going to look at in the first part of class, you're really just creating something that is difficult or impossible to transfer to another project. Uh, for something like that, something you might want to reuse again and again and again, like a piece of furniture or or something that you think could go into just about any building, you really want to use the family, and that's going to be coming in future lectures. Um, you know, a good example of when, when this strategy might make sense is something like a kitchen. Kitchens have a tendency to be really unique depending on uh, what kind of house or a project you're working on. Uh, if you have the basic components, your stoves, your refrigerators, your, um, your sinks and all that, but the way they lay out, it's oftentimes uh, very project specific. It doesn't need to be done in a way that um, that you carry on to another project. So we're going to look at this as an example for when it might make a lot of sense to use the the creating custom geometry within a Revit model. So first, we're going to be opening a component and and taking a look at what a what a component looks like. So under projects. Uh, let's just do a new project. So just for starters, let's make a really basic floor. The dimensions aren't that important, just some sort of rectangle. And let's also put some walls on it. So a quick way to do that would, would be to use your pick tool. So we've just got a generic box that we're working with right now. So for starters, under your components, the top one, place a component. The first one that pops up in the database is this desk. So just take that desk and put it somewhere in your model. It doesn't matter where. And you can use the space bar to reorient the direction that it's going to come in at. Let's go ahead and drop it in your model. Click on it and say Edit Family. So this is a family. This is something that you could transfer to different projects. You could use it on anything. Anytime you're opening a project or creating a new project, uh, this, is, this is something you could use. But let's just look at the structure of it. If you kind of start hovering around, you see that it's composed of these, these different objects with different geometries. But you know, the top, if you click on it, it says Modify Extrusion. The, the tool set that you have here is for modifying extrusion. And it, it means exactly what it says. It's an extrusion. It's, you're creating a, a footprint, and then you're establishing some sort of depth, some sort of parameters that tell you what sort of geometry that has in three dimensions. Um, and just kind of poking around, let's click this Edit Extrusion. And you can see these pink lines on the floor are setting up the geometry, the, the boundaries of that element. And then somewhere else have been specified parameters that show the depth of that in three dimensions. 
So if you go to extrusion properties, yeah. Question? Yeah. Sure. Just going to cancel all that. So again, you can kind of hover around and see these different geometries. If you click on the, <coughs> if you click on the top, and then edit extrusion. So these pink lines define the footprint of it. <coughs> But then under extrusion properties, on these constraints, you can see that the extrusion starts at two feet, four and a half off the ground, and it ends at two feet, six. So that's giving you the, the, uh, the three-dimensional coordinates for how this, how this is constructed. So you can just cancel out of that, cancel out of that extrusion. Let's look at the, the sort of the meat of the desk, this big sort of U-shaped um, uh, U-shaped geometry. And again, if you edit the extrusion, <coughs> you can see the footprint that was drawn. And again, under extrusion properties, these extrusions start and end. Coordinates tell you how deep that is and where it sits in space. Now these drawers, again, are extrusions, but they've been drawn at a different plane. They've been drawn uh, perpendicular to the, to the other two footprints. And we know that by looking at an extrusion, you can see that that's the, <coughs> that's the footprint that was used to set those up. <coughs> and these are a little bit different. The legs, you can see, they start at one size, but they get a little bit larger. And we're going to be looking at how to make something like that. It's called a blend, where you use one shape, and it's sort of blending into another one. So for now, we can go ahead and delete our desk. And let's take a look at that example with, uh, yeah. <coughs> Sorry? How do you take this out of the desk? Out of the desk, Kennedy? Yeah. So there'll be one of these little sections. Out of that we didn't edit it, so it won't ask you to save it, I don't think. <coughs> so let's talk about kitchens. Um, let's load into our model some casework that's in the, the Revit library. If you go to Load Family under the Insert tab for casework, and then domestic kitchens. We've got all these cabinets sort of at the, at the very top. Let's just select all of them and bring them into our project. So if you pick the top one, press shift, go down to the bottom one, the single door, and open. These will load into your, to your Revit file. Everybody with me? All right. All right, so it looks like that import was successful. If you go over to the Home tab, Component, Place a Component. <coughs> if you look in what we have available to us now, we see that all these cabinets are in our options. So. For starters, let's look at this. It's called base cabinet corner unit angled. So this is like a cabinet you'd put in a corner. Go ahead and select that. 
And again, you can use the space bar to change the orientation, but we want this sort of cut off corner piece to face us. <clears throat> and let's put it somewhere over in this corner. Well, it looks like maybe I didn't get it precisely in there. So let's go to a floor plan, level one. Zoom in. We can see that, yeah, I kind of uh, missed the boat on that. It'd be nice if this could slide up against against the, the wall. So you could either take it and just move it manually. Or another tool that's pretty helpful is under Modify. Under this Edit, it's called a line. You can click on your wall and then click on the cabinet and that'll line up for you. All right, so we've got one cabinet in at the corner. Let's look at putting some more in. Go back to your home, component, place a component. And instead of the corner unit, let's look at something else. Let's look at if we've got a you know, any one of these actually is, is all right to use. Let's, I'm going to use this 36-inch uh, double door. And I'll put another one in, um, put in a sink unit over here. So we've got a, a portion of our kitchen laid out. What we don't have is the countertop. So that's something that we're going to use 3D geometry to create. So so go into your level one floor plan. Under the component, choose instead of place a component, let's do model in place. So it asks you what sort of family category it is. And this might be important for visibility tests. If you're looking to maybe turn all of one kind of thing off in a model view, like maybe all of your casework or all your furniture or all your plants or things like that, it's important what sort of um, category you choose. So that if I want to turn off all my kitchen stuff, everything goes away together. So let's do this as casework as well. Click OK. <clears throat> Let's call this countertop. Okay, so notice that everything just went gray. You're now in this sort of modeling mode. You're not in the project. You're, you're modeling this, this one component. And we basically want this countertop to cover the cabinets that we've dropped in to our model. And over here at the far left, we've got two options. We've got solids and voids. And really, any of these sort of components that you can, can create in a Reva model, you can think of uh, as using solids and voids to create it and different, different applications for creating those solids and voids. Um, but there's no one right way to do it. Uh, there might be a lot of different approaches. You could think of it as being an additive pro process of putting in different components, or you could think of it as being um, having some sort of mass that you're chiseling away at with voids. Uh, either approach is correct. It's really just kind of thinking about the object you're creating and thinking about the best strategy um, for defining that geometry in three dimensions. So this is pretty simple. A countertop, um, <clears throat> let's use a solid. And just like in that desk example, uh, the top of that desk was an extrusion. Let's pick that. Everybody with me so far? Any questions? Am I moving too fast, too slow? Andrew. Um, Sure. Model in place is home, component, model in place. Again, solid extrusion. We really just want the countertop that covers, covers this, and maybe maybe even like pops out a little bit on this edge. You know, like if in your kitchen, you've got a countertop that comes out a little bit further out than, than, the, um, than the cabinets below. So let's think about that as we're creating this geometry. 
you know, it's asking you to create this footprint now. And you could use the line tool to just start, you know, tracing around. And that's a totally valid approach. But it's also helpful sometimes to use this pick tool. It's the green line with the pointer over it. <clears throat> if you've got this existing geometry, rather than risk maybe drawing something that's a little bit off from that, you can just use this pick tool to select the line that you need. So if I hover over this cotton tree, I see that it's, it's wanting to select something. So if I pick on that, a pink line comes up, and that's going to be part of our geometry. I'm going to pick this other line. I'll pick here and here. But now if I want a line that comes out an inch or two inches beyond this, what sort of tools do you guys know about that might help me do something like that? I heard a few offsets. You know, that's, there's always more, more one way to, to do something in Revit than, than one. Um, but offset is helpful. We can use the pick tool, but instead of zero offset here, just pick like two inches. And then hover over this line and this line. For some reason, Revit doesn't want to draw this little, uh, doesn't want to pick this diagonal line. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose the, the line draw tool. And I'm going to need to turn off my offset because it wants to draw an offset there now. I'm just going to connect those two two ends. Easy enough, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know what, it's, ex it's, it's not. The way that I just drew that, it's not um, geometrically. But for the purpose of this right now, I'm going to ignore that and pretend that you didn't ask that question. But very precise, very, very um, good observation. But I will show you uh, when this is done, maybe something you can do to really quickly kind of fix that. Maybe just really rough without having the exact dimension, but we'll talk about that. So there's a little bit of my footprints done. Are we ready to make an extrusion? What do you think? If I press finish, finish extrusion, are we in good shape? Probably not, because it looks like there's a lot of gaps in this. What's important to remember when you're doing an extrusion is that you're creating a closed loop. Know, a, a footprint from which you can make some sort of extrusion. So I want to use a trim tool to trim these edges. Actually, it looks like these are unattached now because we had that offset. So we need to trim up those edges too. Make sure our, our path is closed. Looks like we're in pretty good shape. So, yeah, Noah. Shortening the. I might have been. I might have been sick about the Yeah, I think that was actually a little bit of a gap. I think in that two inch gap there, this one was a little bit shorter. But if, if that were going out, the trim, tool, the trim tool could be used uh, to bring them together. Okay. Uh, the trim tool is in, so you've got this create extrusion, this highlighted tab up here, and it's under edit trim. All right, so I'm going to show you a couple different things to think about when you're doing an extrusion. Right over here next to finish extrusion is this extrusion properties. Go ahead and open that up. Now look at what we've got. Just by default, what it's saying is the extrusion starts at zero, so at the ground floor, ground level, and it ends at inch up. Now if we're doing a countertop, is that what we want? Probably not. It's a general rule of thumb is that countertops are around 36 inches in the US. So Instead of extrusion end at one foot, let's do 36 inches. And about how thick do you think a countertop tends to be? About an inch and a half is about right. So let's say 1.5 inches. 
Let's say OK. Let's say finish extrusion. So you brought up the fact that that was a little bit off, the two inches. Just one thing to show you is, you see these little arrows all over the place? These are called grips. You know, if you're not, if you don't need to be entirely precise, maybe you're just doing something really quickly, you just need to get the basic sort of shape of something, and then you can go back later and square it up and get it just right. You can use these grips. And so, if I wanted to just sort of like eye this, I could maybe bring this out just a little bit to maybe compensate for the fact that that was a little bit off. Um, but notice that we finished our extrusion, but everything's still grayed out. We're still in the modeling environment. We've just made one piece of what could be a larger model if we decided to add a lot of other pieces to it. It depends on what our intent is. But if you take a look at the 3D view, we can see that what we created Hmm. Oh, you know what? I totally goofed on that. So, we said that a, that a countertop was an inch and a half. I put in an inch and a half for the start point of that. What we've got is something, this whole blue shaded thing right now, is what I just modeled. Instead of putting an inch and a half here, I should have measured 36 inches minus an inch and a half to, uh, to establish that geometry. So what we can do to fix that is you can click on the element properties since we've selected that piece. And say that's 34 and a half inches. Looks a little bit better, right? Again, we're still in the modeling environment, but by clicking on the element properties, we can also change the material. By choosing the casework category, it just assigns some generic material to that. That's what it says um, by category here. But if you click on that, you'll have access to the materials library and pick whatever you want. So for this, I'm just going to pick this stone. But you could pick something else. You could duplicate that and make a material of your own if, if you were looking for to render a really nice kitchen. But for now, I'm just going to pick stone. So there we go. Now, something else you might have with a, with a counter and attached to that counter while we're modeling is is a backsplash. Oftentimes you'll have a piece of material that sort of uh, stretches the perimeter of that countertop. So let's do that. And it'll be really simple. Again, another extrusion. So if you go to solid, extrusion, again, I'm going to pick my line since I've already got the geometry set up. And then I'm going to offset that. I'm going to offset it Probably more like an inch, but just so it's a little bit easier to see, I'm gonna I'm gonna do two inches here. I'm gonna do that, and then I'm gonna actually I'm gonna take that offset away. I'm gonna choose these two lines, and then I'm gonna use trim to make the footprint that I want. I've got the I've got the lines that I want, but they're all sort of all over the place, and it's not a continuous loop. So I want to use trim to clean that up a little bit. So I want this to connect to that. I want this to connect to that, and so on. So now we're looking pretty good. So if we drew our countertop at 36 inches, where should our backsplash start? What should be the start point for our backsplash? 36 inches. We wanted to start right on top of that countertop. So if we go over to extrusion properties, and the extrusion start, let's do 36. And let's say this is about 4 inches tall. We'll do 40 inches right there. Now let's make it the same material <coughs> as our countertop. We've got our stone. 
Finished extrusion. And let's take a look at it. Uh oh. <laughs> I did. I got a little careless with that um with my entry. Instead it like Revit defaults to feet instead of inches. I don't know if anybody's used to CAD where if you type in 36, it actually defaults to inches instead of feet. So it's a little bit different, something to be mindful of, as I was clearly just demonstrating. I did that on purpose. Um, so footprints, the same thing as, as you did um, for, the, for the countertop. Um, and again, you can use this grip if you want to get close and just approximate, or under the element properties, instead of 40 feet, you could say 40 inches. Whoops, it should be, it should start at 36, end at 40. <laughs> 40 inches. All right, much better. But again, notice Notice that the model is all grayed out around us. These components that we just created are dark line, but everything around it is grayed out. And in fact, if you try to select a cabinet or the wall or the floor, it's not letting you. And it's not letting you because it's letting you know that you're still in the modeling, the modeling tool. So it's really easy to get, get a little bit confused by this. If you go to model something and you think you're done with your extrusion and you're ready to go to another part of your model to work on that, but you start picking around and realizing that it's it's not letting you. Just make sure, if, if, that, if that happens, look over here and see if uh, either the model in place tab is highlighted, letting you know that you're still in the model environment. Or if you just click finish model, it'll, it'll complete that for you. So go ahead and click finish model. And there we go. We've got a, we've got a countertop with a backsplash. Any questions on that before I move forward? Let's see. Okay, so it's important to remember her question's a good one. She's trying to create the back backsplash, but you're actually in the um, you're in the line work for the for the countertop. So you want to finish that extrusion. Go ahead and complete that. And then what, what you want to do is um, go to your your plane, or actually the model is this, and then it's another spot. Oh, okay. So think of it as sort of you know hierarchies of components. Um, you go in the model view, and then you can create all these different elements that make up some piece of the model. But you have to you have to exit that before you're back in the, the project environment. And now, keep in mind also that these things are all going to stick together. It's not going to be like once you exit the model environment, you can move the back class over here and this over there. It's really important to be mindful of where you're at in the modeling process <coughs> so that you're getting what you want out of it. Talked about that. Underground. Um, let's see. Very I'm not sure how to talk about it right now. It must have been something when you, when you drew the you drew the line work. I'm not sure why the line work showed up so so far beneath the oh that's that's pretty interesting. I'm not sure I'm not exactly sure what's going on. I'll put that. 
I got an offset like between the gap between the base cabinet and the Sure, sure. That's a good question. So maybe you don't really have your geometries as figured out as as we do here. And just by way of an example, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to use a section under the View tab. And you guys can just watch this. You don't need to follow along necessarily. Um, if I create a quick section, Now, something important to notice. You know, it'd be it'd be nice, right, if I could just take this and move it up or down. But if you try that, notice that it's not letting you. It's constrained by that um, by that geometry that you created in terms of thir being 36 inches off the off the floor. You can you can slide it around, but it's not letting you move it around. So, what you need is to be able to to modify that is to click on it and then do Edit in Place. <coughs> And then you're able by editing your extrusions You know, it's not quite as easy as I as I thought it was to explain. So I'm gonna maybe we can talk after class about that one. I want to move forward with some of the other um, some of the other tools. So I make sure we get through all the material today.